I'm going to talk about building the health system so that technology uh, or platforms, again, uh, some jargon that I, I really learned um, from people with trainings like some of those in this room. How can we use those platforms to innovate? Or, you know, you've heard all the expressions since then, leapfrog, leapfrogging innovations, disruptive innovations. One of the ways that that can work is to not have systems in, systems in place you can build your own. Another is to have decent, elastic ones. So I'm going to talk about that part. Um, how do you deliver services? What, how do you, what is health system strengthening? And I, I would like to end fairly early so that this can be a, a good discussion for, for me as well. And, and my colleagues are here too. Uh, in, in addition to Hamish, Renee, and, and their team, um, with me today is Claire Pierre, who's um, worked at an IT and health systems in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in uh, in Haiti, and Emily Bonson, um, who is uh, anyway, I'm, I'm her right hand. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, I want to talk a little bit about basic health design, um, and and we'll be focusing on Haiti and Rwanda. However. In each of these sites, um, we've tried to use um, uh, information technology uh, and other technologies to, again, leapfrog. Now, that's a lot easier in a place where there's stable electricity, um, which is to say a lot of the places we work actually do have stable electricity, uh, Russia, the United States, um, or urban Peru. The other sites, however, um, have very disrupted uh, electrical supply. So, for example, Rwanda uh, in 2004-2005 was about 5% on the grid. Haiti is a shockingly low number for the Americas. We had a lot of challenges. So when I say build systems, I, I literally mean build systems. And this is as simple a diagram as I could, I could come up with. Um, as, as Hamish said, Partners in Health is, is focused on three, he didn't say it this way, but let me say it this way, three levels of care, community-based care, which is done largely uh, with community health workers. Community health workers, uh, who we usually call accompaniateurs, people who are accompanying their neighbors with uh, chronic illness, they provide the natural human network to amplify a lot of the technological innovation that is being developed now. So if you if you hear about a point of use diagnostic or therapeutic, um, you know, and I've heard story after story about what's coming down the pike, it's hard to imagine those technologies being rolled out effectively, equitably, especially those uh, most vulnerable and in rural regions without community health workers. That would be one argument. A second is that the community health workers should not be called upon to provide services that are, you know, beyond their or anyone's means. For example, there is a romanticization in international health, what used to be called international health in the 70s and 80s, a romanticization of the capacity of community health workers to solve problems, which is really hidden enthusiasm for spending very little money in resource-poor settings. And one day people will go back and analyze, uh, you know, how, how this ideology worked. But let me give an example. When you hear that traditional birth attendants can very much reduce maternal mortality, just skipping the blood banks, the cesarean section, the modern obstetrics, I would ask you all to be very suspicious of such claims. Because I don't think there's adequate evidence to prove that, to prove that true. So, the first thing that we've done, uh, in some settings, uh, is to actually build health centers. Now health centers, in, in, in the jargon that we're using and developing, are usually nurse-led programs. Um, but nurses are also rare, um, just as rare in the developing world and rural regions as our doctors senior managers, etc. So that's, but that's a, the, often the first step. So it's health center enriched. And then uh, finally, some fraction of the care that would be delivered in any of the settings where, where, um, where Hamish and, and I and others have worked would be incomplete without uh, hospitals. It just doesn't work that way. Um, you know, you could manage very effectively, I believe, you could manage uh, most chronic infectious disease, um, and I'll say this in front of Leo and see if he, he buys this, most chronic infectious disease, I think, can be best managed in a, hosp uh, in a clinic setting or community-based setting. Uh, take HIV disease. 
Uh, there's more seats up here. Um, the, the highest standard of care for AIDS is probably community-based care. First of all, that's the way you deliver a, a therapeutic on a daily basis. Second of all, you also are reducing risk of exposure to the leading opportunistic infection, uh, killing people with HIV in the places we work, which is tuberculosis. And a lot of that happens at the institutional level. So community-based care is better in many ways. However, um, People have complications, you know, whether they, um, you know, people have broken bones and obstructed labor and acute pneumonia. And, you know, again, these, um, and of course, um, any kind of complication of pregnancy, these are really best managed uh, in a hospital. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying health system strengthening. There are these three uh, components. Again, as they say at MIT, it's not rocket science. In other words, we can do this part without you guys. (laughs) But there's a lot we can't do without you guys. Uh, And I'll I'll show you what I mean. First of all, uh, and and Hamish already said this, and I've used these pictures before at at, uh, MIT. Um, Actually, this is not an unusual uh, (coughs) clinical story. It's pretty much the kind of patient I, I see all the time, young person, with HIV disease and another problem. In this case, he's got two. He's got tuberculosis and and, uh, probably inanition and malnutrition just due to those wasting consumptive diseases. Um, It's hard to tell in in settings of food insecurity, you know, how to apportion responsibility for someone's wasting. Is it the disease or the lack of uh, ready access to food? Anyway, he this this patient, his name is Joseph, um, who has of course given me permission to use his images and to broadcast them across the world. I we've already done that when Jim Kim, who some of you may have heard of, um, was uh, at the World Health Organization. He said, "Send me pictures before and after pictures." This is before the establishment of some of the big AIDS treatment and, uh, integrated prevention and care programs. Um, I sent him th- these two pictures uh, and, and, and many other before and after pictures. And he used these two in this glossy brochure. And I said, you know, I'd like a copy of that for Joseph. So I gave it to Joseph and think he would be very impressed with it. And he just looked at it and said, yeah, I'm a star. <laughs> uh, he later went, by the way, um, he later went uh, to one of these giant AIDS meetings. How many of you have ever been to one of these Things is on beyond the uh, some of you. It was what ten, fifteen thousand people. Anyway, I went to one from from Rwanda directly to, I think it was Toronto. It was definitely Canada. All those Canadian cities look alike to me. And uh, and he came from Haiti. This guy, and it was. Uh, I, I learned that one of the cardinal rules of public. I learned many when you take someone from rural Haiti and they've not been to. A place like Toronto for you know there are some things that I know all about like be careful on the escalators this uh, the card for your hotel room door works etc but I did learn a, a one of the important things in public health that we should all know is you just should not give anyone keys to the mini bar <laughs> so anyway the amount of funding has gone up very substantially as we know this is vertical funding is that bad that it's going to be broadcast to Taipei my little jokes <laughs> Um, the, the amount of funding has gone uh, up in part as, as a way of um, countering uh, a lack of really intelligent response uh, to a novel epidemic. So that's always going to be the case. And I think it's not unrelated to the question you're asking in this class. How can we use new technology uh, to promote health equity, but also how do how do we take on new problems? I mean, there was it's not as if we we've ever lived through the stunning changes that went, uh, occurred at the epidemiologic changes that occurred at the end of the 20th century, where you had the leading infectious killer of adults, tuberculosis, persisting, and then joined to another killer in synergy, which is HIV, and it surpassed. TB is leading infectious killer of the adults in the world today, young adults, and they were linked together, and they were invading, especially southern Africa. I would say that's where it was. I mean, all over the world in every urban area, there are huge uh, outbreaks or large outbreaks of TB and HIV. But this burden of disease was especially 
uh, enormous in southern Africa. And at the same time, you have a third. Anybody here an anthropologist? There's actually several anthropologists at, at uh, MIT. There was a third collision, and that was with a therapeutic regime. Like this collision didn't occur in the late 19th century, but in the late 20th century. So it also meant that for a while, in any case, we had to, during a, uh, this period of time, we had to say, well, how, what do we, how do we treat these people? And you heard lots of arguments, you know, uh, uh, that it wasn't sustainable or cost effective. But you really, in the end, had three collisions, HIV, TB, and therapeutic regimes. In other words, treatment for tuberculosis and HIV, which would lead to more complex problems like drug-resistant disease. And then if one of them is airborne, as is the case with TB, I mean, this is a very, to use the jargon from my field, medical anthropology, this is an incredibly biosocially complex set of problems. Now, that's not what I'm going to focus on today. I'm just going to say the platforms that you build to answer those questions that I just posed are the very same ones that need new technologies to promote good outcomes, but also just to manage. And I'll, and I'll show you some examples. So um, <clears throat> some of you uh, know that, um, and, and I, I think uh, Leo and others should be proud of this, that a group of Harvard faculty got together. I mean, people look at this and say, Harvard consensus statement, is such a thing possible? <laughs> but we got together, and not just Harvard faculty, but Jeff Sachs was here then, and a lot of infectious disease doctors uh, and some economists and public health figures and said, you know, we really need to abandon this idea that we have to choose between prevention and care, a noxious idea. We have to have integrated prevention and care for HIV, and we have to acknowledge the complexity of the epidemic. So we wrote that together, and, and uh, we were really pushing for something. This is a, a policy piece, and we were pushing, of course, for the creation of multilateral or bilateral programs that would fund much more ambitious responses to these ranking health problems. And those became PEPFAR, and, and uh, first the Global Fund, I guess, and then PEPFAR. And then this failure of imagination, which was, I believe, caused by a socialization for scarcity, was, was countered really, by resources. And that, that opened up the space to build the platforms that I'll describe and also created an acute need for better management of information. And now, the, I, I will skip over this. I told you we, we talk about accompaniment, but we have good reason to believe uh, that this is the highest standard of care because we've been taking care of people in so-called resource-poor settings, as your term you're using in this class, um, who are still a decade later or more doing very well, like this is, <clears throat> this is another patient of mine, first at home dying of AIDS, and then 10 years later at Sanders Theater at Harvard giving a talk. And that's a very gratifying thing for a, a doctor or nurse or community health worker, as you might imagine, or anyone, right, to have a family member um, who comes back from the dead, as the Haitians say, is very gratifying. And when this happens over and over and over again, you have a lot of satisfaction, but you also have a huge challenge of managing uh, information. And that challenge occurs at each of the three levels that I mentioned, at the community level for the community health worker or accompaniateur, at the clinic level where care should be coordinated, not in the hospital. And then, but finally, at the hospital, how do you track people who do have complications and do get sick again? Um, actually, this guy um, later got, does, can anyone guess, okay, he's been treated now for a smear positive TB and for HIV and he's doing well. What, what do you think now the new and deadly, the people in Southern Africa know this, what's the new and deadly complication? MDR. MDR. So he got MDR. Who, may I ask who said that? Yeah. So um, that's, you know, in other words, we used to believe in the 40s and 50s. Now, I personally was not around in the 40s, so I didn't personally believe anything in the 40s. But we used to believe, as they say magisterial, magisterially in medicine, that you couldn't get tuberculosis twice. But we didn't have the diagnostics, molecular Diagnostics to show that that was a false idea. You can and do get tuberculosis multiple times. You can have even have multiple infections at the same time. And then we said, well, once you treat someone for the TB, they're they're good because they have natural immunity. That also wasn't true. 
So this problem that Joseph had and already survived, that is his second bout with TB, MDR TB, is going to happen more and more and more. And so, again, the complexity of this, and Hamish mentioned some of our work in Peru, the complexity of this is just astounding. You have multiple drugs. You have, if, you know, you're talking sometimes about 10 or 15 drugs a day. You have, not as he said, thousands of patients. I'll show you how many tens of thousands we're talking about. And you have to manage uh, the, the complexity for every patient, but also the complexity of the program. And and at the same time, we have to strengthen health systems. Now, what does that mean? I already told you that we're getting an influx of vertical money focused on AIDS. But with that money, we have to make it do several things at once. One is to strengthen community-based care, right? But the other is to build all those levels, those three levels of, of, of care, including hospitals. So... We developed, I think, along with others, but this language of health system strengthening to describe what it is we were doing with the AIDS money we received, in, uh, especially after 2003. And this is an example of a place before and after. Now it is, by the way, all uh, solar-powered as well. And although the, the person who um, set up that system in, ha- in Haiti and with us in Rwanda and elsewhere died in the earthquake. But, you know, we, we've made a lot of progress on other leapfrogging technologies, including how to power these hospitals. And we learned how to make better hospitals. This one was a few years later. Um, Actually, a hospital redo in 2003, the first place that we used Global Fund money. This is in Haiti. Um, And then we just rebuilt it again from scratch. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Now, this model of three levels of intervention, public-private partnerships, you know, I I could go on. This I don't even know if model is the right word. That is, we also wanted to strengthen which health systems? The public health systems, because those were the weakest. Now, there are some places where people are not at all sanguine about doing that and are going to stick with the private sector. But in general, in Latin America and Africa, the places where I work most, or to say nothing of Siberia, this is a good idea to strengthen the public sector. And uh, in general, I'm not saying we have to be ideological about it. Is there some? I'm glad I'm getting a weekly update call on TV. I told you, Hamish, that I love technology, but not that much. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> As if you were ever on those weekly up- update calls. Now I'll, I'll, I'll be ready when it comes back. So from the Dominican border to... Um, to the coast, and so many of you have been to this this part of the world. We followed this model more or less and started serving uh, uh, a lot of people. How many people? Well, this is this is. I just pulled this yesterday from the PIH report, annual report. Um, and, it, and there's this helpful part in the margins. In fact, whoever made this, I didn't. I wish I could claim to have made this nice report, but this is very helpful. Certainly helpful when you contemplate information technology and managing systems. When you start reaching this scale, and this is more patients served, and I'm not going to talk about quality of care today, uh, although I believe the programmatic care, like for HIV, is very good, as I said. But this is many more probably than the big hospitals in Boston, where, where I train, Leo train. Um, this is a huge, huge uh, scale. Now, you'll hear people talk about scale that involves hundreds of millions of patients, and I'm sure that happens now and again, but it's really, we're, we're, we're still struggling to get there. And I, I train, I've, some of you were involved in the, the, uh, the creation of the Brigham uh, Electronic Medical Re- Record, and you know, I, I was lucky enough to be in that first cohort of American doctors who became accustomed to having electronic medical record. Um, but the real the way I got the idea to push this forward in Haiti and to recruit Hamish, which I did, was actually getting on board a plane. Do you remember this? Every time that you go to American Airlines, and believe me, I have, uh, I, I would put George Clooney to shame, um, they, you, they can't print out the boarding pass if they don't have the right information in, in there. And, it, and it's a program that they code they wrote or stole, I don't know. <laughs> but this was uh, something that American Airlines used not as open source, but they developed their own software. I, you know, I, some of you 
people know the name of it. I, I certainly remember the name of it. And if you don't have all the right information, it won't print the boarding pass. How many times have you seen this? So my frustration was goading. I already told you I'm a specialist at guilt tripping, but I couldn't manage to guilt trip people into making sure that every time a patient came in to clinic, they were weighed. Does this ring any bells? And, you know, I thought, well, let's, uh, what, dock their pay if they don't weigh the patient? Although people do that now, they call it, what do they call that? Yeah, exactly. I just call it, you know, good old-fashioned Catholic punishment. But it didn't it didn't work on a systems level, right? It's good. I'm going to go around to each clinic and, you know, try and shame the nurses. Of course not. It doesn't work. But um, we, we asked Hamish and Darius to, to rewrite our code so that you couldn't prescribe if the patient wasn't worried. It would just give you a, like a message like I just got about the TB meeting. Now, this was quite a while ago before this had ever been seen. Remember, this is an area, these are areas of the world where there's no electricity. So we also had to generate the electricity, put in place a satellite hookup so that there could be automatic up, uplink of this information uh, and actually build the hospitals. I mean, that's an unusual set of demands. Again, I just called that building a platform as if it were easy. If, I, if I'm on service at the Brigham as an infectious disease doctor and think that a patient should have a brain biopsy to find out what's going on in, in some infection or supposed infection, then I don't have to build the operating room and put in the electricity at the Brigham. It's all done. I don't have to do the surgery or anything like that either. But this is what I mean by building a platform in a, in a rural area. Now, here's just back to what you're doing in this class. We knew way before... And again, thanks to American Airlines and those boarding passes. We knew way before this e-health, uh, I'm not going to say craze, because I think it would be better if it were a craze. We knew a long time before that that we needed this kind of assistance. Again, that's why um, we recruited Hamish and started a health informatics team and then later um, tried to develop these open source uh Systems that could manage this kind of complexity, but we also knew um, early on that we there is no way. Have you ever seen a uh, a file room in a hospital? Yeah, it's pretty just sad. We still have them everywhere that we work. The paper files, which you know, if you ha seeing patients with chronic disease, they come back many times, right? It's not the same as managing, you know, a fracture um, or even uh, a childbirth, right? The patients come back with chronic disease every month. And then you have to do what? You have to find their chart. And, again, a lot of people are nodding because they've, they've known how, how hopelessly outdated this system is uh, and probably was, you know, 100 years ago. But now we have alternatives. So that's where we're trying to go uh, and why we need more help, not less help. Now, we, we took this system, this platform, to Rwanda. And also to Malawi, the Sutu, and, uh, and through partner organizations to other settings. But this same model we did with the Clinton Foundation um, uh, was designed to fill in this empty space in rural regions. And the GOR means Governor of Rwanda, CF Clinton Foundation, PIH. We, our, our MO by that time was to build a local sister organization. So some of you here have worked with the sister organizations, whether in Peru or Haiti or Rwanda or Malawi. That's the idea, is you're building local capacity. But by then, in 2004, 2005, we had, one hopes, learned enough about the limitations of our past uh, platforms and could build new ones. But that's why, actually, Hamish and Darius and others actually moved, spent a lot of time, moved to Rwanda with us to create this system a little bit more rapidly uh, than had happened in Haiti, where it had happened organically, or Peru. Um, could we start the right way from the beginning? Now, the answer to that is, is still no. We're, we're still not there. But we, we, I think we've made a lot of progress, and I'm hoping that um, Hamish and maybe Claire will have some ideas, too. So this is what we did. We went to a rural area, and we did the same three things. We did delivered services, which are largely clinical services, we trained local people, capacity building, and we built the systems. Again, this was literally rebuilding infrastructure or building. 
And of course, we saw the same kind of effects on patients uh, as we did in Haiti or anywhere else, you know, where you go and actually deliver high quality and I say community based care to people with chronic wasting diseases. You have the same response. And I remember uh, one of the things that struck me in working in Africa, even as late as 2005, 2006, and again, I, I mentioned the countries I mean, is that people often did not, were skeptical that we would see the same results in rural Rwanda as we had in Haiti. And uh, that wasn't true. Of course, we did see the same results. But I understand after many years of hearing, well, there's medications, but we can't get them to you. It's not cost effective. It's too complicated. They were pretty skeptical when we showed up that this was actually going to work. I was actually in uh, at Princeton uh, in, in that year, maybe 2004, uh, giving a talk, and uh, it was full of very self-confident young people, I'll tell you that. Hopefully you guys are more modest than MIT, <laughs> as nerds tend to be. But anyway, so we're in the, did that go live to Taipei? I don't know if that's good. So we're in this big auditorium, and, and someone says, oh, you're never going to make this model work in Rwanda. And I said, oh, really? And this is someone who looked to me to be all of about 22 years old. And I said, really, why is that? And they said, well, you know, this history of violence and division and, and started, he started, was a he, of course, started naming the different ethnicities. And I said, well, we'll see. You know, we'll see how it works. It, it actually worked even better in Rwanda, this model of community-based care linked to health centers uh, and then on to hospitals. This guy, I, I, have, I will... My uh, medical colleagues have heard me made this, make this joke before, but I'll try. I'm going to do it again. He goes from looking like Skeletor to needing Lipitor. So that, to me, is a uh, really successful intervention. But this time around, we actually worked with Hamish and team to try and develop this from the get-go. So, it, I mean, I could be wrong, but th- this is a uh, picture from Rwanda, right? And uh, it is definitely in Rwanda. I can tell by the table, actually, more than the, my colleague, where we put in place high, um, high-speed high Internet access and started working on a locally adapted commun- electronic medical record right then and there. Now, again, that was... How did you put it diplomatically? That I was prodding you or... I was annoying this team. <laughs> Thank you. Because on the program side, as the doctors and nurses do, we wanted immediate, uh, not gratification, we wanted immediate results. Stock management, patient management. It just was, because our goal in going to Rwanda was take what we'd done in 20 years in Haiti and do it in five in Rwanda. That was an explicit goal. We didn't really know much about strategic planning or how to use language like that. But that's what we said in the beginning, that we would go, uh, you know, somebody out of, at the business school of Sloan ought to write a case about this. That was our strategy. So what's your strategy? We want to, and the answer was to, to go to do what we did in 20 years in Haiti in five years. Because it's a, a country that's much more organized. Um, and this was, again, not in the 90s. This is uh, 2005. And I think uh, people on the Rwanda team feel that, that we have succeeded. And we could not have done it without struggling with some of these uh, issues of the, you know, how to manage information. We also had help, expert help that we didn't have uh, 20 years ago in Haiti. And who were they? This is in Rwanda, but these are not Rwandans. These are our Haitian colleagues who went with us to Rwanda and were very credible mentors for the training that went on. Um, some uh, some of you may know Dr. Leon has worked with us for 20 years. He's a very good teacher, of course, because he's a teacher, uh, as was the entire Haitian team that went there. They've actually done the work. They're not cruising into a an urban hotel to have a two-day long workshop. These are people who went and lived with us uh, in Rwanda from Haiti with real credible experience to share. So that part went, I think, quite well. Um, and then finally, you have to have a there there. You have to be able to deliver the resources somewhere that is not appalling. And uh, we were sent to a an abandoned hospital. And again, some of you have been there. It looked like you might imagine. It looked like it had been abandoned. And we had to rebuild that as well. Although later we found that the best health system design was when we uh, could build from scratch and not have to redo. Yeah. That little cross? 
That's an X. <laughs> I thought you were a Scot. I thought you were a Scot. I thought you were going to say something constructive too. But <laughs> so you know, and then as the years went by, there were at that time in 2004, there were four of 30 districts that had no district hospitals at all. We were assigned to three of the four at our request. We said we'd really rather go to a place where you know there, where there's the greatest need, but also where you could show that this is more than possible in a setting like this, again, without electricity. This this is uh, in Butaro in the north. And uh, don't look, Hamish, ignore the little beeps and blurbs. And there's no, there was no electricity there either. And this is probably about 400,000, 500,000 people without a hospital. So we went into the health center and, uh, and transformed it into a hospital with the ministry, of course. Um, and then we built another one, uh, this time to our own specifications. Some of you have probably heard from a group with actually some MIT involvement as well called MASS. At that point, this group hadn't formed, but it's a, a design, mostly architects, but also some engineers who are working on social justice projects. It, and, and they were born really in the process of, if I can say that, I think they say it quite a bit. They were really born out of doing this uh, work with us in Rwanda, and you can see that looks like a. I, I say that looks like a, you know, artist rendering. That's a photograph. That's what the hospital really looks like. It's a, a very beautiful hospital. Now, and, and just for the data at the bottom, people ask a lot. And in fact, the last time I gave a talk here at MIT, uh, I was practically assailed with questions about sustainability. And uh, I was trying to figure out who, which professor was responsible for that, but couldn't. <laughs> Uh, you know, the idea is that you work in the public sector for a number of reasons. One, as Hamish said, referring to some other uh, work of, of mine, which I f- kind of forget about, is that when you're thinking about a rights-based model, who confers the right to something, like the right to health care, the right to education? The public sector. So working with the public sector has that advantage as well. And then getting the scale, any kind of scale. I, I believe that the notion of scale, as we anthropologists would say, has been somewhat fetishized. People talk about scale all the time, and you're never quite sure what they mean, at least in public health. But, you know, because they're always talking about national scale, um, but there are also subunits of the nation, and in this case, the district, that are all, they're important to, to work with, and that's what we've done mostly is work at the district level. So that's the model replicated uh, with, with the same challenges that we'd seen in Haiti and elsewhere. Um, but a little bit more of a head start, I would say. And now let me just give you some outcomes and then uh, open this up for the discussion. Uh, first of all, Rwanda, we had bet heavily, as, as, as we decided in 2004, we bet heavily on Rwanda being a good place to bring to scale a rural health project. The Clinton Foundation had bet heavily on it, and Partners in Health had bet heavily on it, and I think we were right. Because at that time, I can tell you, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm among some of my circles on the rights side for working there. But happily, we made our own assessment, and we said that this would be really forward-thinking people to, to work with on the district level and on the national level. And in fact, the, the director of the National AIDS Program, who has been to speak here before, uh, Agnes Benaguajo, uh, um, has since gone from director of the National AIDS Program to the, um, the lead technical position in the ministry to the Minister of Health. So we've got to grow. We've been able to grow with her, and this is what she's done along with many, as she would be quick to add, that I don't think has been done anywhere, and that is universal access almost to antiretroviral care. And there was a lot of talk in 2004 about, well, there's a small number of patients in in Sub-Saharan getting care, but it it was more like a tiny number than a small number. I I have, in, in all these years of doing this work, I've never seen someone living in a rural area of Africa and in poverty, uh, except for, um, sites that have come up with uh, PEPFAR or, or the Global Fund, I had never seen anybody on care. I saw people who know their, knew their status, knew their CD4 counts, but they weren't getting medicines. Or if they had, they had received them only irregularly by paying some astronomical sum for them. Uh, and, and so this is a huge achievement. And Rwanda is not, 
I mean, it is post-conflict. It was very poor. It's still very poor, but it was very poor back then. And to go from zero to now, I think they're up to 100,000 people. That's pretty much complete coverage. Now they're looking with active case finding for others who need care. I don't want to overstate this, but if you get to 90,000, you're probably talking about 85% of all people living with HIV who need uh, who need care acutely on therapy. Now, we have not worked uh, in all those sites, of course. Hamish has concerned himself with the national program, as have I. I have worked, along with a lot of my colleagues, in three of those four districts without a... Uh, without a district hospital, but through the electronic medical record, through e-health, through policy discussion debates, and uh, later a training center that we built in this rural region, the first place we went, we've also participated, we feel, in a stunning reversal of fortune uh, in Rwanda. And let me just give you some numbers. First of all, when you integrate these programs, and this is language uh, from Julio Frank, the dean of Harvard School of Public Health, who is Minister of Health in, in Mexico, has actually visited us in Rwanda. Um, when you integrate, when you do, uh, again, I showed you an AIDS program, a vertical program, same for a family planning program, would be a vertical program, or a tuberculosis program. When you can integrate that into a health system strengthening model, uh, you can have impacts far beyond... You know what the intervention is designed, or the vertical intervention is designed to do, and that's what I think we see happening in uh, in Rwanda. So, looking at child mortality, and maternal mortality, and juvenile mortality, this is again a stunning reversal on the national level, and uh, it's actually been wonderful to be part of Rwanda during this time, this past decade, because trust me, after 1994. There are a lot of people who are only too happy to write off Rwanda as a chance, as a place where recovery could occur. And many other maimed states and weak states have still struggled, and, and I've seen that in Haiti. But Rwanda really did turn things around. Glad to talk about that. We uh, made our contribution there, as I said, uh, with the ministry and, and the Clinton Foundation and many other partners, and then uh, set off to other settings in Again, rural Africa. This is part of an initiative we called in 2004 the Rural AIDS Initiative that Clinton launched that year. And it was pretty much the same thing. Now, let me close by talking a little bit about two things. One is conscious attempts to t- tackle this challenge of information technology and, uh, and health system strengthening. And the other is, as you might imagine, what, what, is, what are some things that we didn't plan for and uh, I could, I'm not going to say couldn't, but there are some contingencies that, that happened in Haiti recently, as you all know, that we were unprepared for. And uh, I'd like to open up uh, some of our refle- some reflection on how IT um, could be and can be useful there. Now we've developed, along with many partners, this GHD Online platform, which we'd love to make sure. Uh, it gets improved and used. That's another thing about, uh, we were just saying, Hamish and I were quite skeptical 10 years ago about what he used to, what he calls telemedicine. And it's just that it was so much discussed, but so little implemented. Right? So you go to the places I work, there's no electricity, there's certainly not going to be telemedicine. But again, you know, now, you know, we have to revise that because with new technologies, including broadband access and rural reaches, you can imagine a much more robust platform, to use that much abused word, uh, in using um, telemedicine, but also um, this, this platform, again, which should be linked to other efforts. And as you can see, there's lots of members in a lot of countries, and a lot of them are NGOs, hospitals, academics, um, and, and this platform is, again, open source. This is, I bet you I learned that term from Hamish and Darius. I had no idea what that meant probably 10 years ago. Uh, and it was a bit of a you know, struggle for us. I was uh, looking for expedience and saying, no, speed it up, speed it up. Um, and, uh, but I think the purists were saying oh, the open source part is really important. If some of this code we will take us a long time to rewrite, but we should do it ourselves so that we can say this is uh, an open medical record system platform. And uh, so I'll just say publicly thank you for that teaching. 
Now, the contingencies I want to close with is, uh, and again, Claire, Pierre, and many of you have been down to Haiti to help. But Claire Pierre um, actually lived through a lot of this uh, with me, and, and I'm glad she's here. But it was a very uh, difficult time, as you might imagine, after January 10th. And this is the, uh, the nursing school, the main nursing school. And this is 4.53 in the afternoon. So when you think about health system strengthening, there's the three levels I talked about, community-based care, um, health centers, and hospitals. But there have to be people in there delivering services. And the loss of a generation uh, or, I mean, everybody in the second year class perished, and their teachers did too, pretty much. The lo- there's the loss of a huge number of health professionals just in one day. You know, again, people weren't prepared for this. And rebuilding Haiti actually means rebuilding at all those three levels, uh, including the tertiary medical center level. And then, of course, uh, I say, of course, Haiti, the the earthquake was followed temporarily by a cholera outbreak, which, you know, some people call a secondary spike of mortality. But it wasn't really related so much to the earthquake as the terribly weak water system. So I'm saying this is a limitation of health system design because it actually occurred, uh, and I gave a talk about this at MIT last year, this epidemic occurred right in the area where we'd been working for such a long time. So it's a pretty humbling reminder that building health systems has to be linked to other systems, water and sanitation, education, food security at the very least. Shelter I would throw in there too. And of course, why not add jobs? I tried doing that with the Global Fund grant. I would say, oh, no, we can't have just an AIDS program. You have to have a women's health program. And they said, women's health program? This is not the Global Fund for Women's Health. And I said, well, how are we going to do prevention of mother-to-child transmission without thinking about the moms, too? And don't we want to promote family planning? Anyway, so I'm kind of a pro at that, too, broadening the mandate of others without their knowing it. <laughs> anyway, so this is squarely within my remit, right, infectious disease epidemic. And uh, we've been trying, and again, I want, I'll be glad to talk about this if anyone's interested. We've been trying to respond, obviously, with by reinforcing water and sanitation, but we've said, wait a second, we've been here a long time, and we've failed. Um, I'm, we don't have a lot of confidence that it, you know a bunch of USAID contractors are going to come in and solve the, all these problems. We've been working here for decades. We've heard all this before. We have to think of new technologies, again, back to the theme of this course, um, not just to count the number of people affected, like John Snow did, but to prevent uh, infection, as he did by uh, taking the handle off the Broad Street pump. And so, you know, uh, I think Hamish worked on this. I, I believe others have as well. We uh, working with um, humanitarian and, and disaster relief outfits to try and find out where this epidemic was going and, uh, and to do what was our job to do at the very least, which was reduce what's called case fatality rate, the number of people sick who actually got. I'm happy to tell you, I think in Mirabale now, which I'm going to return to in, um, in a second, uh, I don't think we've had any cholera deaths recently. So we have a lot of cholera, but the staff there has been trained uh, to deliver, the, uh, make the diagnosis, deliver the care. And that's a good thing, but it's still not going to get rid of uh, cholera from the island. So we have to do this long-term work um, and we also have to, uh, I, I, I think I skipped one slide because I didn't want to go on too long, but we've also launched a, uh, an integrated prevention and care program that includes um, a vaccination. I may have thrown that, thrown that back in. But back to this model, right? Again, not rocket science. Um, I'd argue that, you know, 20 years from now when people are writing books about health system strengthening, they'll basically des- describe this. Community-based care, health center and rich, hospital link. And there'll be better language for it, new jargon, and hopefully new research posts and new contracts we USAID. But, I'm kidding. Uh, but this is the basic model. And, and again, it's not rocket science. Now, we also considered very strongly what should be our signal effort post-earthquake in Haiti. And um, we were already building yet another a community hospital in this town near Bale, which I happened to be working in in 1983 uh, as in the year between college and medical school. And uh, so I was pretty excited about building a community hospital in Bale. But after the earthquake, we went back to the drawing board. Literally, I say we, 
we this time we turf this over to real professionals to redesign the hospital. Again, I said we had a pretty good community-based design. Health centers, um, we were doing okay, although I still think a lot of them are dangerous as far as nosocomial infections go, especially in Southern Africa. Uh, but our weak point, uh, some of us felt, was still the quality of the design and construction of the hospitals. And then throw on top of that the earthquake in Haiti and the, you know, the destruction of the medical infrastructure, the training infrastructure, rather, in the capital city, because that's where all of it was happening, 95%. Um, and then the loss also of 20%, probably, of the health professionals in the earthquake, of the practicing uh, health professionals. So this is lo- loss or, or maiming, let's say. So this is a cause for system redesign, right? And when President Clinton started talking about build back better, build back better, you know, we're asking, what does that mean? And we thought, this is what it means. We're not going to take shortcuts this time on construction. And that means, obviously, things like building code. This, this hospital was designed to California earthquake standards and beyond. But also, how are we going to power it? If it's going to be a medical center rather than a community hospital, you know, we're going to go back in and then put in the solar. So we've been doing that. As I mentioned, the, the, our chief partner, the implementer, died in the earthquake at American. Um, but we had, we knew we had to do something very different. And so we, we redesigned the hospital um, and built it. I say we. I, I didn't do any heavy lifting. But we, we've actually managed to get, and I, I hear I always try to make a tribute to one of my former students, uh, David Walton, who is the project director, but also to a uh, con- former construction company magnet who started a construction company here in Massachusetts when he was 22 years old. His name is Jim Ansara. Built a big company, uh, sold it, and then since the earthquake, he's basically been down in Haiti. Some of you, if you ever get to meet him, he's a very quiet, uh, somewhat gruff, but terrific guy. And uh, together, they put together a team uh, that has people from all over, from the United States, Dominican Republic, and especially Haiti, and built this really terrific uh, hospital. So I'm going to I'm going to stop here and open it up for discussion uh, with the summary point that there, it, in order for you guys and those of you who are interested in technology, not all of you are actually going to generate the technology, but for those who are interested in technology and how it works, remember that you need a there there to a platform that is built. And sometimes that platform is already halfway there, three-quarters of the way there, but sometimes it's almost absent completely. And that's where I hope people like me come in. We're not on the cutting edge in terms of technology development or new tools, but we're, in a way, on the cutting edge of health system design merely because we're going back and saying, well, you can't really skip over that step. You actually do have to have hospitals and health centers and community health workers. So thank you very much, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. Hello, I'm sorry, I went over a little bit. Um, we have plenty of time, actually, so that's okay. not a problem. Um, a couple of things. First of all, um, we'd like to get some questions or comments from the students in the class, first of all, if that's all right. Um, and I know you have a, a few ideas that you would like to ask Paul about. Um, just a couple of quick comments about some of the things uh, we, that we discussed in the lecture. I mean, one just about open source. In addition to making software available to other organizations and countries, one of the things that we keep going back to is the fact that there are differences and there are different requirements and different customizations that are required in each different country. And as the sort of varied, very sort of varied nature of the environment we're working, by using open source, we give control and um, leadership and ability to actually manage this project to people working in different countries. And that's particularly true in Rwanda, where we've trained a lot of people who are now able to program assistance. So I think in addition to the kind of um, almost like a you know, human rights approach of making these technologies available and really empowering people, it's also really essential to allow them to be adapted to the real needs on the ground rather than something that looks similar, such as you know, the, the requirements in Haiti and Rwanda, which are superficially similar, and many things are the same, but actually are not quite the same. And the other comment I just make about the cholera outbreak, that I know that there's many people in the MIT and the Boston community who've been looking at the question of how do we actually 
understand and measure what's going on there. And so Paul commented about some of these issues in, you know, in one of the slides. And I know that many people here have been interested in that question and have been looking at a whole range of different ways that we can look at the um, what's going on, which communities have good water supplies, how can we even track which pumps are actually functioning using cell phone connections to those, um, how do we overlay that with social networks and actually manage to track the cholera outbreak through those as well. So I think there's a lot of areas where there's overlap, but um, I will not <laughs> take over this. I'd just First of all, I'd just like to say, um, doing the students in the class have questions. Yes, please. And would, would you, if you don't mind introducing yourself, just in the hopes that I will stay in touch with some of you. My name is Sherry Ward. I'm in the MPH program over at the Harvard School of Global Health in the Global Health Department. Um, thank you for coming to this presentation. And I also wanted to say thank you. Um, I heard you speak in Mirabai and in January. Did I did I cry or not? <laughs> uh, that was a very emotional talk, but it really um, affected the way I think about delivery and resource support settings. And I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you for coming all the way to Haiti to hear it. It was great. Thank you. Um, now my question is, what has been your experience with any M Health technology and either yourself or with partners in health um, that was very successful that you felt made a big difference in patient outcomes? And why do you feel that those specific programs were successful? Well, I'm going to tell you again for, as, the, as the outsider and then ask Hamish to, to comment on that. The outsider meaning the insider clinically. Um, I would, if I had to choose one, uh, leaving aside the electronic medical record, you said M, mobile, right? It would be the cell phone, uh, the use of cell phones by community health workers in Peru to manage complex uh, pharmacopoeia, you know, these, these regimens that are sometimes have 10, 12, 15 medications. And I would say that that is probably, a, and, there, I, and my colleagues are doing that in Mexico, um, in Rwanda now, uh, in Haiti, but the Peruvian it looks to me like they're really the community health workers really can't work without it and in their uh, handheld devices. Would, am I right or not? I mean, actually, in Mexico in particular, Dan Palazuelos has work looking at um, how we can uh, simplify the prescribing of certain key medications and providing that support is probably the most advanced one that we've been looking at. I mean, I think there there's a huge amount of energy in, in M Health at this point, and many people looking at different ways that we can use it. I would say that we. We've had specific benefits. I mean, the other thing we did in Peru actually was with palm pilots before. That's what I meant, handheld devices. And, and being able to collect that data and improve quality, for example, of access to lab data. I know that Narak was also interested in this question of how do we actually get the lab data from the from the laboratory, maybe the remote part from the patients, back to the clinicians caring for those patients. And that's, I think, been one of our biggest pushes. Um, I mean, going forward, there's the big question. This is actually one that I'm very interested in. Um, two randomized control trials we talked about in the class looking at text message reminders for patients to take their HIV medications and showing that there was a benefit in that. But at the same time, to my knowledge, and I think we're still trying to map this out, this is not as effective as a community healthcare worker Plus. to do that. And so there's a big interesting question that we have not resolved is how well does the company term model function in different environments relative to the phone? And I, I believe that the community healthcare worker is actually a much more effective approach. However, there's also the questions of how you organize that. So there's a big, interesting question in the sort of public health aspect, which I think is going to be one of the important things going forward in the next couple of years. If I could just add to that, um, back to the, the question of comparing some of the neat gadgetry that has been advanced by MIT specifically. One of them, I remember, was a, a, a urine strip to test isoniazid levels in the blood to see if you were actually compliant with your regimen for tuberculosis. And I was saying, okay, then you feed the strip into a cool little handheld machine, and but well, you could have given someone a job to be the community health worker and visit the patient. And accompaniment, so this is another... I'm, I, I don't want to sound like a Luddite. I believe that is the technical term, remember, for Ned Ludd. And if, I don't even know if he was a real person, but trying to slow down your peeps, trying to slow down the Industrial Revolution. On the contrary, I'm not. I'm just saying we need to learn how to measure, especially you know, at the School of Public Health or in the, in the Economics Department, the, the positive impact of actually reducing unemployment. And then community health workers are far and away the largest fraction of workers 
at Partners in Health, which is, counts probably 15,000 uh, employees, and most of them have never had a job before. So there's this virtuous social cycle that gets started just by using human labor when you can, and you want to never fail to integrate new technology at the same time that you learn how to value positively uh, giving a job to community health worker, which, by the way, still, as I said, delivers a better service, but also has these other things we need to learn how to study. I mean, something that we're doing a lot at the moment at PH is looking at how the really effective community health worker programs and the training and the way that those have been set up and managed can be linked to these sort of mobile devices. And that's in Rwanda in particular, where there are 40,000 community health care workers um, hired by the government and being trained. They are working really hard on how you can actually link that using initially text messaging, rapid SMS. Um, but, you know, how can, that, how can we actually build on the strengths of both of those things, the, the, the community and the, the employment of people who can really get into the patient's homes, but also linking that so that you can, for example, ensure that somebody has TB and it wasn't known um, when they were in the clinic that you can get that message to the healthcare worker and bring them in to, you know, for further treatment. Another question? Yes, please. Hi, um, my name is Eden. I'm from Brandeis University in the International Health Policy and Management Program. And uh, needless to say, I've been reading a lot of your books and I'm just a couple of... Oh, don't say needless to say. Say away. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled. <laughs> so I've been following your work a lot and I would say, um, including my professors here, you guys are one, one of my idols here, and I'm grateful to be here. Um, my interest has been uh, throughout this class in my uh, anthropology studies, um, how to uh, measure and maintain quality of care within those settings when the priority is in giving access and in maintaining sustainability within the healthcare system. Um, how to maintain quality? How to maintain um, quality of care. Yeah, excellent. I know you did not talk about it earlier, but I yeah. Well, um, first of all, this is a. It's not that I didn't want to talk about it. It's just such a humbling topic, um, the quality issue. So, again, we were moving towards scale, but I would say the main reason that our organization isn't in 25 countries, but rather only in 12, and isn't trying to claim nationwide coverage, is because of. A hu- I hope a humility about quality. We don't believe that it's that easy to just go in and fiddle with a policy and and, su- and suddenly the quality of care changes on a national level. Sometimes, you know, but it's usually a, a mix of resources, human and, and, and other kinds of capital, and then the implementation. So we're very focused on implementation, and even with that focus, I would say that we, you know, we've had a you know a big quality problem with scale just like everybody else. So that's what we're struggling. You asked me what measures, okay? Um, they're, they're most of them are proxy measures. Like I mentioned one, right? I said, I didn't really say it, but I'm going to say it now. Just look, when you're looking at outcomes of HIV and TB care, you obviously have, uh, you can use viral load, right, for HIV, for TB, you can use smear microscopy, microscopy or some of the new diagnoses, but you can also just, also just weigh the patients. So again, a proxy measure for quality of services is if they gain 20 pounds, you know, like Joseph did and, and John, that was the name of the other guy, then that's a pretty good proxy measure. It's inexpensive and it can be sent in by a mobile technology. Now let me just, I can go through this like for diabetes care. Well, hemoglobin A1C is, is one measure, right? So you can imagine, again, a, a hand, this time I would actually say it would be better to have a handheld device that could actually be, you know, use a, f- a finger stick is painful, some of you know, but get a sample uh, that is able to tell you, well, what's the blood sugar and what's the hemoglobin A1C? These are proxies of quality. You could use, a, as people at this institution have are sort of the pros now in random, you know, randomized trials of positive social outcomes. They're using, you are using those who do that work, proxy measures. So I've found there's a long list of them. And even in a setting where you wouldn't easily have access to a lab or you wouldn't have access to, uh, you know, a researcher who is registering things using questionnaire, 
you still, if you have this network, this platform, you still have your community health workers, and they can manage quite a bit of complexity in terms of reporting if they're supported fully. So I think for each of these problems, you can find proxy measures for quality. Now, I would add in, and I'm just learning about this, uh, Julio Frank, your boss, is uh, he has a mentor, I think at University of Michigan, uh, had a mentor, uh, who is uh, sort of the father of quality improvement from the 70s and 80s, wrote a paper evidently in Millbank Quarterly in 1960-something. Julio Frank just told me this. And he, not Julio, but his mentor, one of them, said that there are many f- kinds of quality. There's technical, co- technically competent co- quality, the least we could do. But there's also respect for the rights of the person, the, the so-called client, patient. Um, and, uh, you know, and what about the dignity of the surroundings in which the care is delivered? Like, we've focused a lot on that. And uh, Julio's been helping us. Yeah, go ahead. Um, any others? Just to let Class. That is tough. <laughs> my, my name is Bill Fong, I'm a number student at Brandeis Bain in the uh, International Health Policy and Management uh, Program. And my question is, uh, I know you've, you've done a lot of work with technology in, in, in uh, mostly on the clinical security in curative settings and HIV and CAD, but I was wondering, Looking at maternal health, for example, mm-hmm. and if you're looking at the uh, antenatal care coverage, mm-hmm. a lot of the programs and in increasing use of that, I would say, has been focused on incentivizing women through vouchers and cash transfers for them to come to this system. From a technology standpoint, from how would you use technology to, to get people, I would say, to value something like AMC? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm glad you asked me. First of all, but first of all, I think there's a right track and a wrong track. And the right track is the cash transfer part. The wrong track is trying to, you know, and again, this is, I have a colleague here and I'll see how she thinks I do. There's so little knowledge in public health of how structural problems, poverty, gender inequality, travel, transportation, whatever. There's very limited understanding of how those things determine agency, the ability to choose. So I would say the wrong way is to try and get people to value things when we don't have evidence that they don't value them. What we have evidence of is their inability to access them. So this is, it's a somewhat subtle point, um, but I think cognitive approaches um, to... For example, the promotion of, of ANC, um, uh, that is exhorting poor women to do what you want, I think they're fraudulent. And I also think they're heavily funded for a reason. Because what they do, and yeah, I want to see how you think I'm doing, what they do, what these approaches do, is to move the locus of the problem into the head of the mother and out of her conditions. Right? They're saying we have to make you value this because you don't value it. What's the subtext? Is you don't know you're not able to value antenatal care. But actually, we don't have data for that. What we have data for is to show that they don't. There are barriers: user fees, transport. You know who's going to babysit the other kids. So when we and a lot of anthropologists would call those structural constraints as opposed to cultural or cognitive. Now, here's the scam in my view, and I guess I might as well know I'm transmitting this around the world, is that the idea that these are really the problems of poor people is really good for us, people like you and me, who go to places like Brandeis and Harvard, because then we get a job afterwards if we can yell at poor ladies and tell them what to do, right? And we'll get funded for that for years and years, and we'll even be able to repeat the cycle and do research on that as if we didn't already know that antenatal antenatal care was good, right? So I think, um, you know, how we use technology, back to the point of your question, in, in something like making people value these good things that we believe in include cash transfers and even, heaven for fen, unconditional cash transfers. Because after all, poor people have been making unconditional cash transfers to us for many centuries. Right? Yeah. You with me? Yeah. Um, so I think using those technologies to transfer resources rather than just reminders. And I, I'll be looking forward to seeing the, the results of those studies. But um, 
you know, reminders are one thing, <coughs> exhortations I'm calling them, but just link these technologies a little bit to removing barriers. Like, for example, if you if you look at structural barriers to care, again, I mentioned transport, have the voucher go all the way out to the woman, you know, move the antenatal care to her, or bring her to the antenatal care. And again, think about all these structural problems. Who's going to take care of the other kids? How is she going to get there? Is there going to be a long line? Is there a hidden fee? Is there an open user fee? Right? Because you'd find out, people say, we don't have any user fees. And then you go and do research, and there are user fees. They may be hidden. They may not. So that's just my own personal take on that. Now, I, I don't go out to a conference on, you know, how to make women value antenatal care and say this stuff. Actually, I don't go to those conferences anymore. <laughs> Because I, I think they're a bit of a, as I said, a fraud. So actually, there's a question from Lauren, who's one of our students who unfortunately can't be here today, which I think is, is very relevant. Um, and it relates also to something that last week when I was in Haiti, we were looking at our system, which does very close to what Paul was describing with the American Airlines, where each patient is registered. It only took you 10 years. It did take you years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for some good reasons. Um, and so it prints out an ID card, actually a plastic ID card with a barcode on it. And so each patient visits is track, and we can see when they come back, and we can see the same person, and we can get to the lab data and so on. So it's a very important foundational um, component which we hope to really be able to scale up in the, the Mir Valley Hospital as a, as a critical first step. Um, but it also introduces and kind of furthers one of the questions that we often get, which is, what are the trade-offs between collecting personal data in information systems? Um, and the potential risks or perceived risks that they pose to the patients, and then the question of how do we improve access to care. And it seems like there's a bit of a tension there. So Lauren had actually asked a question around yeah. that. I don't know if she's listening now or is just going to hear this later, but um, this is a, a, a problem that I've... I, again, I'm going to use a little uh, political economic notion here. The The... The times I've heard that question most has not been in settings of great rural privation from our patients. It's more from our staff, interestingly, right? Um, and so the primary, again, this is a gross generalization, but I think it's true nonetheless, gross meaning grand, uh, that um, the privacy concerns are tightly tie- tied to class aspirations, Right? So a lot of the people we're serving, AIDS is kind of just the latest problem to show up in their lives. You know, some of the people you've met in rural Haiti. And uh, their primary concern is access, back to the second part of her question, is how can we get care? Um, I remember being told in, uh, again, here, that when you go to Rwanda, there's so much secrecy, no one's going to know their status or tell you their status. I went in 2004 out to community meetings the year before we started, some months before, in a village where, you know, in the city this might happen, in the village in the rural area, say, oh, well, how many of you have HIV? And they'd all raise their hand. And how many of you know your C4 count? And they'd be going, oh, 262, 84. And these are in very public fora, you know. And so I would just say we have to be very careful to respect that question, how to pr- protect privacy. Uh, but it, it's still not fundamentally related to it's not been on the top five uh, barriers back to your question uh, to, to access in the rural re- regions uh, or even I think in the urban regions it's in the maybe top 15 as a barrier itself <coughs> now that doesn't mean we don't have an obligation to take this very seriously as I know you and your team have with unique patient identifiers and sign in code so you can't log on the system in Haiti Unless you use your user ID, just like at the Brigham, you know. And so, um, your electronic fingerprint, if you're going into someone's medical record, is there. But again, I think that's just uh, that, that's us being responsible, um, to, you know, to have no, not a double standard of care in Haiti uh, and, and Rwanda, Malawi, etc. But again, that the concern comes largely from has come more from our employees than who also, I mean, our employees with HIV than from uh, the patients who we've been seeing in these first years. And I think that's an interesting... I mean, an anthropologist ought to go in and talk about how some people have these aspirations where suddenly, for the first time in their lives, HIV comes along to spoil their aspirations, whereas other people have been living 
a lifetime of disappointment. And, you know, the, again, this is the latest thing to come in and spoil aspirations that were set low to start with because of so many, so much unfairness. Again, lack of access to school, primary, even primary school, to a job, to family planning, to, you know, on and on the list goes. Thanks. And the only other thing I'd add is that the policy issues at government level, there isn't a policy around patient confidentiality, which is the case in a lot of developing countries. That's so that's another factor. So just to open it up to other questions. Yeah, I mean, I, please. Yes, um, there is a link also from the uh, School of Public Health. So I've got a question um, to you about uh, using the human rights framework yeah. in, in what you do and the status of technology within that. So given the rise of M-Health, telemedicine, um, E-Health... All the you too with the telemedicine. I am the telemedicine girl too. And um, uh, do you think that it is inherent in the right to health, technology is included within that, or do you think there is an on-the-ground, on tangible, important role, for the separate right... Yeah. of the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress. What do you think that's now required <coughs> given that technology is so central to health today? Well, I mean, I would I would say that it, it is possible to exploit multiple frameworks at the same time, mm-hmm. and I've, I, I'm also kind of a pro at that, right? So three big frameworks. One, the rights-based framework, which I find very useful. Uh, another would be the public goods for public health framework, which the public health people, as you know, develop this, they're comfortable with it, it it doesn't, you'll find a lot of people in public health who are uncomfortable with the rights-based approach, they think it sounds shrill, or, you know, I get get that, and then a third, how are we going to, which is kind of the economics development framework, (laughs) how will we break the cycle of poverty and disease if we don't invest in these new technologies, so I think either way you look at it, these frameworks lead to the same thing, which is valuing uh, scientific progress as the basis of a lot of these interventions. I think that's a healthy thing to do. So whether we say, well, you know, just the right to health care will drag in the right to technological advances, I think that's true because all of the technologies we're talking about that I've spoken about today, each of them is a post mid 20th century development antivirals, antibiotics, diagnostics and the the maladies themselves right? they've changed at the genetic level drug resistant TB, drug resistant HIV drug resistant staph aureus, blah 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 Um, they've all um, I guess blah 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 is not really good to broadcast internationally but you know what I mean so I think that that model is still robust say look if you want to if you want to talk about the right to healthcare you're going to have to talk about the right to access a new Technology. Now, at the same time, does it weaken or strengthen the argument? Because this is really about an argument, right? A pitch for using these developments to promote uh, health and well-being among people who have been cut out of scientific progress. I think it's also helpful to have people think about the digital divide, the, you know, what the cost of not having access to these new technologies is in a rights-based uh, framework as well. I think it's complementary rather than corrosive or um, so I, I would actually say that we, working together like if we get the IT nerds together with us the health providers it's a very powerful thing ITNs I think we've room for one or two more questions yeah. am, I, am I yes please and then can we just at least take these three because they're all in a little triangle and I said so <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to speed it up if I may uh, I'm Jean Gilman with the Security Studies Program at MIT. And I have a question about surveillance and how you think about sur- disease surveillance. Yeah. We've had a great controversy about H5N1, and that research is, at least the Wisconsin aspect of it, is uh, to be published in Nature imminently. And the Science Magazine will also be publishing the Rotterdam results. And both of the uh, categories of researchers have said that they're doing this research, which is uh, to actually jump ahead of nature a bit with host um, uh, host responses to avian flu, H5N1. Um, they both said that what they want to do is create mechanisms for improved surveillance. So I'm asking you about surveillance, yeah. because are these platforms that you have established and that you're looking at, are they also good modalities for, for surveillance, which is a huge problem if you look at avian influenza? Um, and then I guess um, I think B 
behind behind that question, I think would would sort of be a, a larger question about um, which has already been echoed here is are are we bringing people into the 21st century? And are, are, this is very futuristic. This is a Foucauldian question. This is a Foucauldian question. <laughs> no, please. So, um, no, I, just, I, I, I guess it's this, this whole issue of where is basic science relative to what you're doing? And I know you think of this in a treatment mode. Yeah. The way people are looking at it now is in a surveillance mode. Yeah. But I can throw you the general question of where is the link between basic science and treatment as it impacts your project? Yeah. Can I start with the second part and go back to surveillance? Because, you know, there are multiple regimens of surveillance, as you well know. But back to the, the basic science question. I would argue that we, in no example, is more powerful than AIDS. That in 30 years, only 30 years, that you can go from a new uh, syndrome, in a, you know, at least in, in this part of the world, and certainly newly described, identify the pathogen, learn how to stage, diagnose and stage the disease with great reliability, and then have a, a fairly reasonable treatment regimen developed, uh, suppressive chronic, but still pretty pretty good. I mean, look, at, certainly looks good to me as a doctor. All that has happened in 30 years, and it's all due to basic, I mean, it's all built on basic science, laboratory research. The, legit, the therapeutics, the diagnostics. So I think that is a pretty powerful example of how you can link uh, scientific development to uh, a great need. Again, I mentioned already the leading infectious killer of young adults in the world and a huge killer of children as well. And elderly people. I mean, it's just the and then there's the indirect cost to the elderly and the young who are not infected but are, are affected. So I think it's a good story for science, for basic science. And that it also gets back to the surveillance question because I remember, you know, um, some of the things. Indeed, I wrote about this in the '80s um, about the negative aspects of surveillance of HIV, and there are a lot of people writing about that in the '80s because we really, you know, we really didn't have a good therapeutic strategy then, but we did have the, the people did have the ability to discriminate against people with living or living with HIV in the workplace and in housing questions in this country and in all kinds of ways and in other settings too. So the negative aspects of surveillance are also out there. I don't know which one you were leaning on, Gene, but um, in terms of surveillance to serve as uh, as opposed to to discipline, um, these platforms offer great potential. And I think one of the, again, one of the smart things for us to do to, to show how surveillance of an epidemic is a good thing is to link that to service, like with cholera. Do you want to count cholera victims or do we want to eradicate cholera from the island of Hispaniola and develop a stockpile for the world? We want the latter. And we want to count cholera cases so that we can build better budgets and better interventions and raise resources to save lives. But we also want to do it, uh, you know, to eradicate the disease. So for, to the extent, now back to the general point here about surveillance, stop looking at your cell phone, Hamish. What's you the time? Um, <laughs> so... You know, I think the promise of good surveillance uh, is, is, is comes out of these platforms and that the net good is going to be huge. We also just have to link that back to the rights questions that were mentioned already, and the right of it to access is the biggest one among them. So we've actually got um, about five minutes, and there is a class after this. So I think what I'll do is just a quick announcement and then one more question. If that's right. Sure. I do want to talk. So for ne- just for next week for the class, uh, we actually have a class project presentation. So we're looking forward to that. And other people who are interested are welcome to come and join that. Um, uh, as I said, there is another class coming in. So in about five minutes, we will need to enter, leave the room. But everything sounds. we'd like to use that last time for at least one more question. Everything sounds better with the Scottish burr. <laughs> like, get out. <laughs> And then I'll, I'll stick around outside, by the way, if I'm late. So, so are you here. Now, I was curious if there was an optimal mix of the number of participants in the process. So the, the physician, the yeah. nurse, the community health worker, the patient. That's a great question. Is there, where, 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 where the, the, the stop where do you try to engage the whole community? Because yeah. it's a community-based approach. Do you engage the whole community? Where does it stop before it becomes like an issue like here, where there's so many participants in the process, like third-party healthcare managers, yeah. insurance companies, before it becomes 
<laughs> it's a great question. I, I will say, given the um, threats that I just received from your course director, <laughs> that of all of my coworkers who are working on this question of the ideal structure, how many health workers, um, to nurses, to doctors, how do they fit in with a larger community of people living with HIV, women's groups, community groups, how do they fit in with uh, the ministry? It's, it's actually, there's quite a number of us in Rwanda working on this project, and, uh, and Michael Rich, my wife, plenty of people who are working really on this question, What's this, what should it look like? And I think that that's going to lead to a great efflorescence of you know, knowledge and, and, and its review and publication, but I can connect you to all that right now. And they've already started, I think, to publish some stuff from the Doris Duke grant. I, I don't know if that's true. Um, but as far as third-party payers and the complexities that we've seen in resource non-poor settings, non-resource poor settings, sorry, we're starting to see that in Haiti, too. I mean, that, that challenge. For example, this new hospital we're building, um, looking at Dr. Pierre, we're going to suddenly, for the first time in our history, the 200,000 insured families in Haiti out of the 11 million uninsured are going to be coming to us with actually the ability to reimburse us. I mean, it's going to be a novel experience, let me tell you. So we're also going to have to take on that kind of complexity to move, moving forward. In Rwanda, that was sort of pushed on us with a mutual system, an insurance system uh, that was also community-based. But I think we have to, we're going to have to get uh, stronger at this in those settings where there aren't many formal structures like that and then see if we can apply lessons here or from here uh, in, in going forward. Well, anyway, thank you all very much, and I'll stick around outside. <laughs>